It may be the most famous handshake in Jewish history, perhaps the most well-known handshake recorded on film in all of history. And it took place on the lawn of the White House, September 13th, 1993, to seal a peace agreement process between the State of Israel and the PLO the Palestine Liberation Organization. As Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat signed and agreed to the Oslo Accords, which everyone hoped would bring an end to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict with the PLOs recognizing the legitimacy of the Jewish State of Israel and with Israel's agreeing to the creation of a Palestinian state. Sadly, the Oslo process did not produce the results so many dreamed it would. I'm Mark Golub, and to this day, Oslo remains one of the most controversial and somewhat painful word in the history of the Middle East. It was the product of months and months of behind-the-scenes secret meetings and then negotiations, at first wholly unofficial, set in motion by a number of remarkable, courageous individuals. You know, many of us are very familiar with the names and faces of the founding generation of the State of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, Chaim Weizmann, Menachem Begin, Golda Meir, and then the slightly younger generation who stood at their side, Yitzhak Rabin, Shimon Peres, Moshe Dayan, Ariel Sharon. But there's a second generation of Israeli leaders who have literally shaped the state of Israel as we know it today, though their names and faces are far less well known by American and world Jewry. One individual in particular, a Sabra, born in Petach Tikva less than a month after David Ben Gurion read the Declaration of Independence of the Modern State of Israel, and he became a most eloquent voice and force in the peace movement in Israel. His name is Yossi Balin, and he's a man who has made a most profound contribution to Israeli life and to Jewish life worldwide with a long and distinguished career as an Israeli diplomat and politician. Among the many positions he held in the Israeli cabinet, Yossi Bellin served as Minister of Economy and Planning, as Minister in the Prime Minister's Office, as Minister of Justice, and as Minister of Religious Affairs. A longtime member of the Labour Party, he left Labour when it joined Prime Minister Ariel Sharon's coalition government and went on to head the left-wing Social Democratic Zionist Party merits until his retirement from Israeli politics in 2008. Again, Yossi Bellin was also a major force in the creation of one of the most successful initiatives to strengthen the connection of American Jewish youth with the State of Israel, Birthright Israel. But perhaps the most significant piece of his political life took place after the Labour Party's victory in 1992 when Yitzhak Rabin became Prime Minister and Shimon Peres became Minister of Foreign Affairs. For it was in 1992, as Shimon Peres's Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, that Yossi Bellin was instrumental in setting up secret back-channel meetings between Israelis and Palestinians, which grew into the Oslo process, which established the Palestinian Authority on the West Bank and in Gaza, which brought Yasser Arafat back to Gaza, and which for a moment in time gave the world real hope that there could actually be a resolution 
to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Of course, the Oslo process failed. But Yossi Balin remained deeply committed to the peace process with the Palestinians, participating in the Israeli-Palestinian talks in Taba, Egypt in 2001, and the Geneva Accords of 2003, which proposed a means of implementing a permanent peace agreement between Israel and an independent Palestinian state. And with that brief summary of just some of who Yossi Berlin is and what he's accomplished in his years of service to the state of Israel, you should also know that he's being portrayed on stage in a new play at Lincoln Center called simply Oslo. The play is written by J.T. Rogers, who freely acknowledges that his own imagination is what this play represents, the play that shows the backstory that led to the Oslo Accords. Events are compressed. Characters in the play represent multiple figures in the actual Oslo process. And all the words spoken in the play by historical figures are J.T. Rogers' words that come out of his own imagination. And since many Americans and many American Jews will see this play, which received excellent reviews, and I saw the play, it's extremely well written, well directed, well acted by a superb cast in which Yossi Balin is played wonderfully by Adam Danheiser. We asked Yossi Balin to join us to tell us some of the real story of the secret meetings he helped establish with a Norwegian academic, Professor Larsen, the professor's wife, a foreign service officer named Mona Juul, and Yossi Bellin is on our JBS phones from Israel now. And Yossi, it is an honor for me to speak with you. I thank you for joining us. Thank you, and uh, thank you for talking to me. So Yossi, the writer of the play Oslo, is clear, unequivocal, that the play comes out of his imagination based on meetings he had with Professor Larson and his wife Mona. The play suggests that you first met Professor Larson even before your boss, Shimon Peres, became foreign minister, and that you then sent two Israeli professors, Yair Hirschfeld. Yair Hirschfeld is the, one of the professors you sent. They were not schooled in diplomacy at all, and your goal was for them to meet with high-ranking PLO diplomats to see if there was any possibility of starting a peace process, even though, Yossi, it was then against Israeli law for Israelis to meet with the PLO. How accurate is that depiction of how the process began? Well, first of all, it was not against the law. It was one day after changing the law, uh, in which, uh, which allowed uh, Israelis to meet with uh, PLO people. Uh, we would not have uh, met the PLO uh, representatives in the Oslo process had it been against the law. I, I have never seen uh, the play, by the way, so I don't know whether they are portraying it as breaching the law. If they are doing that, it is uh, not the real story. You did ask Yair Hirschfeld to represent Israel? It was a kind of an academic uh, meeting under the umbrella of FAFO, the research center of the trade union uh, in Norway, uh, headed uh, by Terje Larsen. So it was a kind of an unofficial uh, meeting. Nobody represented uh, officials. Uh, and uh, what we wanted to, uh, to do is to uh, test the water to uh, see whether there was an opening uh, with uh, the other side. And uh, so we did not uh, waste time uh, between changing the law, meeting with the PLO, understanding that they were serious, the people whom uh, we met, and uh, trying to have a, a, a kind of a draft uh, agreement with them uh, on uh, Gaza and uh, later on on Jericho, uh, which uh, happened even uh, earlier than expected. Very interesting. Yossi, the play suggests 
Foreign Minister Perez did know of the meetings, but that Yitzhak Rabin did not know of the meetings. Is that true? No. Perez knew nothing about these meetings. And the, the, the story, the real story, is the very uh, problematic relationship between uh, Rabin and Perez. Rabin became the prime minister. Uh, he was not too happy about uh, having Perez around because the animosity between them. And he didn't even want to nominate him as a foreign minister. Eventually, his advisors told him that he could not ignore the former leader of uh, Labour, and uh, suggested that he would become the, the foreign minister. But uh, Rabin said, OK, you will be the prime, uh, foreign minister, provided you will never touch neither the Israeli-Palestinian channel nor the Israeli-Syrian channel. Very interesting. Now, uh, you may say that somebody else, uh, me, for example, would have immediately said, thank you very much. I don't go to cocktails, and uh, if this is uh, my job to have the title, so I had the uh, more important titles in my lifetime. But this, is, this was not what uh, Paris uh, uh, said to Rabin, maybe because he is more resilient than myself. And he said, okay, okay. Now, I had already the contact with uh, the Norwegians and with the Palestinians. I mean, the idea was that if uh, I am becoming uh, uh, somebody who is dealing with the peace process uh, in the foreign ministry or elsewhere, uh, I could use the, a, a, a kind of a back channel in uh, Oslo in order to solve the problems which were raised in Washington between Israel and the Jordanian-Palestinian uh, uh, delegation. Now, when I wanted to talk to uh, Paris, about uh, the possibility of going to, uh, to Oslo. It was after many meetings with uh, the, the foreign minister of Norway and uh, the, his deputy and uh, Terry Larsen and the Mona Larsen. Uh, he told me that uh, the same day uh, he was forbidden for meeting the most important Palestinian leader in Jerusalem, Faisal Hosseini, the late Faisal Hosseini. And I said to myself, if I am now telling him that I intend to go to Oslo to talk to the, to the PLO, he will say to me, forget it. I mean, I, we cannot <laughs> do something like that because yes. we have uh, the, the decision of uh, Rabin. Now, this was not something that was, had, had been known by the people, but that was the reason why I couldn't tell Paris about it. And had I, had I told Rabin that I was going to Oslo, he would have thrown me away uh, from, all the, the st from the staircase. Yes. So the only way for me to tell them that we have a, a contact with the PLO and that it is serious was first to be sure that they are really serious and to bring them something which was a real paper. And that's what, what was achieved in a few weeks. So if it, we began in, Feb, in, in January, in February, we already, after the second meeting, had a draft paper, uh, Yair uh, Hirschfeld and Ron Pundak, who represented me, told the Palestinians that they were in very close contact with me, even though they did not tell him that I sent uh, them. But they, they wanted uh, to know whether I can be behind this uh, paper and uh, what about Rabin and, and uh, Paris. And that, is, that was the point. When we first had the paper, in February, that I went to Paris, and Paris, when he read it, and he had his uh, reservations, by the way, uh, said, if, if you want to continue such a channel, of course, I have to tell Rabin. And I was sure that if he goes to Rabin, Rabin would tell him, with all due respect, I told you something, and you are breaching uh, your promise, and you are dealing with the Palestinians directly. And uh, so I, I waited for his meeting. They had weekly uh, meetings in four eyes. So I went to the end of, I, I waited for the end of this uh, weekly meeting. And uh, I was 90% sure that Robin would tell him, forget it. But uh, eventually I understood why it did not happen, 
that uh, Paris came and said, uh, we have the green light, you can, we can go on. And uh, the rest is history. I mean, the rest is that it became uh, from a secret, unofficial uh, meeting. It was a secret official uh, channel uh, in which uh, official people and then the Director General of the Foreign Ministry, who is Savile, uh, led the, uh, our delegation rather than Yair Hirschfeld. And uh, it became, it became a, 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 an official meeting between official Palestinians and official uh, Israel. That, that went on until August when it was actually signed secretly in Norway, and in September it was signed uh, in Washington, and since then we know the picture that you uh, referred to before. How did you have the guts to do this in the first place when you really worried that Shimon Peres and certainly Yitzhak Rabin, if they knew, they'd throw you out on your ear. How, what prompted you to take this risk when you knew or when you felt that you know, the two people who were running the Israeli government would not like this at all? How did you do that in the face of that? because I got the information about the ongoing discussions uh, in Washington. And I saw that although uh, the government was changed, the policy uh, uh, went on in the same way like it was under uh, Prime Minister Shamir. Uh, it was the same head of the, our delegation, Mr. Eli Rubinstein, who is a good friend of mine, and now he is a, a, a judge of the Supreme Court. Uh, then he was the, the, the cabinet secretary, and he was the head of the delegation. And the same issues about the number of the members in the Palestinian uh, Legislative uh, Council and about uh, other minor, minor problems uh, remain, uh, re re remained the impediments in the discussions. And I say to myself, why did we come to power after so many year, years? We came in order to make peace with the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And if I have a, an option to, to do something, I cannot play uh, according to the uh, political correct, politically correct uh, rules. I, I have to do something uh, and to prove that it is not so difficult to bypass some of the problems there, to find solutions to others, and to go on. And it was really easier than expected. It was Ahmed Khoury, correct, who was... Yes, lead... Abu Allah Ahmed Khoury. That ultimately he was totally frustrated with Yair and that at a given point in time you said, okay, I will now send a formal representative of the Israeli government and you chose Uri Savir. Is that generally correct? Yeah, but, but this is not a story. I mean, I did not uh, choose, uh, or I would have chosen him had it been up to me, but this was a decision of uh, Rabin and Paris. Why was it uh, their decision? Because when Rabin, uh, at a certain point, became sure that Oslo was the most important channel, since it was proven that through Oslo we could change things in Washington between us and the Palestinians. And this was the indication that Oslo was superior to Washington. So he, he decided to send uh, uh, somebody, uh, some, some official, uh, to, uh, uh, to Oslo. Paris said, I, I am the volunteer. I'm ready to lead our delegation. For sure, Rabin, who hated him, <laughs> was not ready to, to even hear about it. So he invented something and said, well, it should not be a minister, uh, it should be a sub-ministerial level. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the highest sub-ministerial level, a, 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 a diplomatic sub-ministerial level. I was the, high, the highest sub-ministerial level in the ministry, but I was a politician. So the one under me was the director general. And uh, it's like secretary... Deputy Secretary and Under Secretary, and Uri was the Under Secretary. And uh, so uh, Perez said, "Why not Uri?" And Rabin 
I'm not sure whether he was too uh, enthusiastic about it because oh, he was very close to uh, to Paris. Uh, but he said yes. Okay, so let's let's uh, send. Uri. Uri had no idea about what was going on for months in Oslo. So I I called him and I told him uh, that there is such a, that there was such a channel, and that he is chosen uh, to lead uh, the delegation, and he was really thrilled. By the way, but, uh, but it was not my nomination. Okay, I understand. How many people were in the delegation for each side? At the beginning, two on each side, then three. Sometimes at the end, uh, there were four on each side. Four on each side. Okay. It starts as a very small group, doesn't it, Yasi? Yeah, with with a very problematic back office. Uh, so we had to to prepare everything. We have to prepare the kids, the tickets. We had to prepare the technical things which were usually prepared for us, and we didn't even know exactly what uh, to do with it. Eventually, we succeeded in it, but but it was a, a kind of a, a, a real beginning. Now, another thing, nobody asked who paid for the ticket. Who paid for, for the ticket of the unofficial group? Yes. It was Norway. I mean, one of the reasons why it happened there was that the Norwegian government was generous enough in order to provide the security for the people and their tickets and their logic. Uh, because we could not, I mean, I could not uh, use my budget in the four ministries for that. Because yes. It was not an official uh, uh, mission. Yes. So it, it was really something which was not exactly written in the books. Because in the books you have you have a prime minister, he has a policy, he calls his foreign minister, he tells him this is the policy, this, this is my policy, the foreign minister is calling his, uh, his devoted uh, deputy and tells him, okay, now you have to find a channel. But this was the other way around. Very interesting. And I want to, again, make sure our audience understands. By the time this process, by the time you're sending, by the time... Whoever sends Uri Savir, it sounds like it was Rabin's decision and Perez went along. So at what point in the process do both Perez and Rabin understand that you have started this dialogue which seems to be promising? When do they know? When did they know that it was going on or yes. when did they know that it was serious enough? When did they know it was going on, and then when did they sort of give it their own stamp of approval? They, they got the information, or oh, Perez got the information from me, and uh, in a day, Rabin got it from Perez, and that was the end of February, meaning uh, about a month after the beginning of the process. One month in, they basically both knew. Yeah. Okay. If if you count the months from April when I met for the first time with Terry Larsen, so of course it's it's uh, almost a, a year. But uh, but one should not count it. I understand. How much credit do you give to Professor Larsen and his wife Mona? The way the play the play is written from their perspective, they're the ones who spoke to the playwright, and they convinced him that this would make a good story. But it's from their perspective, and the way the play presents it, Larson had a unique theory of negotiation where people would negotiate inside a room with no outsiders present, but when the negotiation day was done, they would come out of that room and they would be in a social setting for the rest of the time. They would eat together together. They would laugh together, they'd get to know each other, and that from that informal social interchange would come a sense of trust, maybe even they would begin to really like each other, and that would spill over into the way negotiations were conducted inside the room. To what extent do you understand that to be, that, this, that Larson's process was instrumental in uh, in, the, in the Oslo process working, to what extent do you feel that's a sort of a romanticized dramatization? It is fiction. 
Yes. Based on, on a real story, but it is totally fiction. Yes. And uh, now, speaking about uh, whether or not uh, Terry, Terry Larson uh, was pivotal, he was, he was very important here. He suggested the channel, but does it mean that the other channels were not available or, or were not uh, possible? Uh, no. I, I tried uh, two other channels. One was London, another was uh, Washington. Uh, and uh, and it was impossible. But uh, it, it would have been very difficult to have the Oslo process or something like that without it. This is true. But it is not necessarily that when there were crises about specific issues, he suggested solutions. I was surprised to hear you say that you believe the Norwegian foreign minister knew what was going on from the beginning? Of course. I mean... First of all, it was not a, a horse, but it was Stoltenberg. Uh, Stoltenberg was the foreign minister of uh, Norway. Uh, when I began my role as the deputy uh, foreign minister, uh, he, he was a friend of mine, and uh, Stoltenberg is the father of uh, the, the prime minister uh, of uh, Norway, uh, until a year ago, and today the head of NATO. Uh, Stoltenberg knew exactly about the story. He knew it for me. I mean, uh, we talked about it. Mm -hmm. And um, about the idea. And he sent to me his deputy in September 92 uh, in order to have a working uh, session, but the, the, the working session on bilateral issues uh, was actually a disguise for a, a more intimate uh, meeting with uh, the, the deputy uh, minister uh, and with Tarja Larsen and with Mona and with Yair about how to uh, establish the, the, the channel. Now, Stoltenberg became uh, the, the UN uh, representative uh, to former Yugoslavia, and he was uh, replaced by uh, Horst, who had been before the Minister of Defense. Right. So Horst became the Minister of Foreign Affairs in, only in April 93, during the, the Oslo process. So he was brought in to the story in the middle of the, of the process. And then, of course, he, he, he had all the information from his uh, deputy and from uh, uh, Terry Larson. I remember one Friday... He called me uh, in the afternoon, uh, Israel, uh, Israel uh, hour, and uh, he said to me, "You'll see, I'm ha I'm having a meeting with the Secretary of State, uh, Warren Christopher, and please, please tell me what can I tell him about it. I want to tell him something." Mm -hmm. And uh, we did whatever we could in order to uh, keep it very secretly. I mean. We, it was a success story from this point of view, because for, for uh, nine months, nobody knew about it, and the media did not know about it. So I broke my small head about what uh, could he tell uh, uh, Warren Christopher. I didn't want him to tell the whole story, and uh, I, I told him two or three points that uh, were kind of a, a good enough uh, information uh, without telling the whole thing, which he, he did, and then he called me and thanked me for that and said I, I did exactly like uh, that. So it was a small group of Norwegians, Israelis, and uh, Palestinians who were uh, privy uh, to, the, to the story and worked like a small family almost. Very, very interesting. The, what was the reason it was so important to keep the United States, and again, as you have alluded to, there were talks going on in Washington between Israelis and Palestinians, with Washington being the sort of the intermediary, the, the, the broker who brought everybody to the table. Oslo is happening at the very time that these meetings are going on in Washington. What's the real reason you didn't want anybody, even in, on the Israeli side, 
on the American side. You wanted nobody to know in Washington that Oslo was taking place at the same time. Why? Because we were afraid of leaks. We, 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 we believe that uh, had uh, people uh, known that uh, we were talking directly to the PLO, even though it was, it was legal, but uh, it was unheard of, so uh, the, the media will immediately make out of it the, the most important uh, news. The opposition will scream and shout. Netanyahu, of course, uh, would say that it is kind of treason, and it would be become very, very difficult uh, to talk. Not that in, in, uh, on the Palestinian side it would have been very simple. Also there, the same kind of treason uh, could be charged. Mm -hmm. This is why it was very important for us to keep it uh, in the room. I understand. Now, the play then brings a character in, Joel Singer. He's depicted as a high-powered Israeli lawyer who was working with a prestigious American law firm based in Washington, D.C., and he insisted that the documents which Savir and the Palestinian counterparts had created be worked out all over from a much more practical and specific perspective that if the Oslo Accords were to create a new Palestinian government that would govern a new Palestinian state, every detail of governance, including such things as picking up the garbage and collecting taxes from both Palestinians and Israelis living in Gaza and the West Bank, that all that be spelled out in, in detail. What do you understand Joel Singer's role to be? Well, I picked uh, Joel Singer uh, because I was very impressed uh, with him when he was a colonel in the army in the judicial uh, department, and he was in charge of the negotiations uh, with, between us and the, and the Egyptians uh, in uh, 86 on the Taba area in Sinai. And uh, I didn't know where he was, and apparently he left Israel and went to Washington, as you said, uh, to work for, for a, an important law firm. I wanted him to uh, be the, the legal advisor of the ministry, and uh, he uh, was happy to come to Israel and to do that, uh, but he had to wait a few months. And then when, be, when we began the, the Oslo process, uh, then I thought my, maybe the best thing was to uh, include him in our delegation, so that will be the beginning of his work for the ministry. And uh, he did not leave the office. He would work there through the week, and on the weekends would go to, uh, to Oslo, and then uh, go from Oslo to uh, Israel. Uh, he was part of the, of the steering committee, led by Rabin with Paris, myself, and himself, which used to meet uh, at least uh, once a week. And uh, so he w could report to us about the negotiations and get the, the directions uh, for the negotiations uh, next week. It is true that in the first meeting in which he participated, he uh, saw the, the material. Of course, he saw it before on the way to Oslo, and he had uh, many remarks. By the way, a Palestinian state was never mentioned in Oslo. I'm sorry, say we that. Just, I'm sorry, say that again. A Palestinian state was never mentioned in Oslo, as none of the permanent solutions was not uh, mentioned uh, there. We just agreed to deal with issues like borders, like settlements, and water, and uh, and uh, Jerusalem. Uh, but we did not speak about the Palestinian state. But it is true that he had uh, many corrections and many ideas, and it was really for us a sigh of relief uh, because uh, we worked there without a lawyer, and uh, it was important uh, to have a legal, uh, the legal advisor. By the way, the Palestinians, it is not that they came without a lawyer. They didn't have a lawyer. Yes. They didn't have a lawyer who could be a counterpart to the two hours, and eventually they brought a, an Egyptian lawyer to help them. But in the meantime, it so happened that 
our legal advisor was also an advisor for them. And he, he would say to them, for example, if, this in, if, if you are demanding A, B, and C, then uh, it is totally illegal uh, according to the international law and whatever. So uh, for a while, he served as, uh, as all, as a joint group which uh, was trying to, to uh, have an agreement and to make peace. I understand. It was not always, you know, a rivalry. I understand. Was this Joel Singer you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Uh, look, Yossi, the, the play portrays the Palestinians and Israelis as wanting this peace process equally. Uh, they're, they're shown equally in terms of the conflict and in terms of desiring a peaceful resolution. As you understood what was going on at that time, would you say that the Palestinians who were part of Oslo were as well-meaning as the Israelis who were part of Oslo? I have no doubt. You have no doubt? No. Talk for one minute about why you have no doubt. By the way, was Yasser Arafat 100% in favor of this secret back-channel negotiations, and was he 100% behind the, the fact that these accords were going to come out of it? I think so. I, I, he, he was privy to the details. They came all the time with his, uh, with his remarks and uh, notes, and uh, at the end of the day, in, uh, on, on August 18th, in 93, uh, there were talks for about 10 hours between him and Paris about the details before Paris signed the agreement with uh, Abu Ala, with Ahmed Korea. So, so uh, it was mainly uh, the current president, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, Abu Mazen, who was in charge of the talks. So he was my parallel on the Palestinian side. But uh, he, he had the full backing of uh, And you say that Shimon Peres actually spoke with Yasser Arafat for 10 hours before yeah. the final, before the sort of the agreement was accepted by both parties? Yes, it was the first contact between them. Was it on the phone? On the phone, yeah. Uh-huh. By the way, the play does dramatize that, the play ultimately works up to where Shimon Peres negotiates the final terms on the telephone with the Palestinians, and uh, the final terms are worked out between the Palestinians and the Israelis, and the last, the last sort of thing that happens is Shimon Peres agrees to postpone the ultimate status of Jerusalem, and when he does that, the Palestinians agree, according to the way the play goes, and uh, they become a reality. And the, this, the play then describes Yasser Arafat and his entire council as weeping at the other end of the phone. Have you ever heard of that weeping taking place? After the assassination? I'm, I'm sorry? After the assassination of Rabin? No. When Perez, but then, then when, it was. Then we, we know that they, they cried. After they, and Arafat even went to Tel Aviv, came to Tel Aviv in disguise to the Shiva, uh, met with uh, Leah Rabin and uh, and extended his condolences. They were really broken after the death. Okay, of, no, uh, I'm not. Don't jump ahead of me. We're almost there. I'm not talking about when Rabin died, was assassinated. I'm talking about. At the end of the phone call between Perez and uh, Arafat, when Perez says, okay, we have a deal, did Arafat and his Palestinian council that was with him at the time begin weeping on the phone? Ah, okay, I, I don't know that. I know that they were very, very excited. I, I don't know uh, something like that. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, then we get to Washington. Is it true that at the very last minute, 
the Palestinian delegation or Arafat insisted that the document be changed to include the words PLO rather than Palestinians. No, I mean, the, the point was, this was an issue, and the, it was only or almost a, a crisis, but the point was the following one. The, on the paper, as far as I remember, uh, it was an agreement between the government of Israel and the joint jordanian Palestinian delegation. Now, uh, the Palestinians came to us in the morning, and about two hours before the... Uh, the signing uh, ceremony, and said, "What does it mean, the delegation, <laughs> the, the Jordanians? Who are the Jordanians? I mean, what what are you speaking about? Uh, it is between Israel and the PLO, isn't it so?" And Rabin was very angry and said, "If you insist that it would be between the government of Israel and and the, the PLO, for whatever reason, I don't understand why. I didn't understand even then." Uh, but but you can understand that psychologically it was very difficult to admit that we were talking with the PLO even then. Uh -huh. So he said, okay, I'm packing, we are going, no, no uh, ceremony, you can tell everybody that it is off. Um, and we were in the, in the hotel, all, all of us. Uh, so for a moment I thought, this is the end of the story. And then, of course, we found uh, a, a compromise, like uh, whenever two, the two sides uh, want to have an agreement, so they find compromises. And uh, what uh, what happened was that uh, it, it was an agreement between the government of Israel and the Palestinian part of the Jordanian uh, dele uh, Palestinian delegation and the PLO, something like that. So, uh, yeah. It was a moment of, of crisis, and we had many moments like that in which unexpectedly one side uh, insisted on something which uh, eventually uh, became an impediment and was solved. You were actually on the lawn of the White House when the Oslo Accords were signed, correct? Yeah. Yossi, what was that like for you? What did it... I mean, here it was like bar mitzvah for me. <laughs> bar mitzvah. You know, everybody uh, came, shook my hand, the, the UN uh, Secretary General, and then the, the Prime Ministers, whom I knew, and four ministers. The whole world came there to, to this ceremony. No question, by the way, that it was exaggerated, because it was just an interim agreement. The point was the, 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 the signatories, not the, the, the material itself. And eventually it created a little bit a kind of an exaggerated uh, picture of making peace rather than uh, agreeing on the first uh, step, the two words peace. But the event itself, although it was very, very hot the day in September, uh, but it, it was like unbelievable. Really, it was, I mean, I, I could not believe that something that we, we began in such a humble way a few months before, it became the most important thing in the world for a while. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you saw the actual handshake. A lot of people have written about it and talked about it. They've talked about how difficult it was for Yitzhak Rabin to shake the hand of Yasser Arafat. What do you know of how Rabin felt at that moment? Well, we were never close, and he never uh, told me exactly his uh, feelings, but uh, it, it was very uh, clear. I mean, uh, it was difficult for him to uh, uh, to cross uh, the line between uh, I'll never talk to the PLO, and they are all terrorists, and even no preconditions or whatever, and, and uh, shaking hands and signing a joint paper uh, and whatever. So uh, he did not uh, hide it. Uh, while uh, Paris, uh, for him, it was a little bit easier. He's interesting, interesting. Okay, so Yossi, as you now look at the sweep of history that followed that handshake, why did the Oslo Accords fail, in your view? I think that the biggest mistake was not to go to the permanent agreement immediately. 
I, uh, I was very afraid of the extremists on both sides. Not that I knew what, uh, what could be. I mean, it was much, much further than my, my, my fears. Uh, neither the, the massacre in Hebron by an Israeli doctor, religious person. I mean, this was impossible to believe that something like, like that hap- will happen. No, the assassination of uh, Rabin. Uh, and and no no the uh, the suicide uh, bombers on the Palestinian side. I thought that there would be that, that there would be demonstrations and things like that, uh, like it was in Sinai in in in, in eighty two. Uh, but I I believe that we had a a unique opportunity to go for the permanent agreement. Uh, Rabin, I, I tried to convince Rabin to continue not to sign an interim one, like uh, Begin suggested in Camp David, or five years of autonomy and whatever. And, and we, we went in his footsteps, uh, but to go for the real brave uh, step. And he said to me, if we go for the permanent agreement and we fail, it would be very, very difficult to go back to an interim solution. While if we go to an interim solution and fail, we can always go back to it. It was reasonable, but wrong. Mm-hmm. Yossi, what would have happened had Prime Minister Rabin not been assassinated by this right-wing Jewish fanatic? Would there have been a two-state solution if Rabin had lived? I think so. I think so. I cannot prove it. And, uh, you know, this is a very, very difficult question to answer. I know. I, I believe that there was a very good chance. Uh, to get to the May, um, to May the fourth, ninety nine, which was the deadline, with the permanent agreement uh, between uh, Rabin and the Arafat, despite of the difficulties and and the death around. All right, everybody understands the perspective you brought. First of all, to Israeli politics in general, to the peace process in general, and to Oslo. Critics of Oslo say that Arafat was never seriously committed to a peaceful resolution of the conflict with Israel, and that at the same time he's signing the accords in Washington, that very evening he goes on Arab television saying that the Oslo peace process is simply the first step, a deceptive act in the ultimate plan by the Palestinians to ultimately win all of Palestine, from the Jordan to the Mediterranean Sea, and that critics say, look, the PLO charter was, that calls for the destruction of the state of Israel was supposed to be changed. It never was changed. By the way, the PLO charter is never even mentioned in the play. But critics believe that Yasser Arafat was never really serious about implementing a two-state solution because he was committed to a jihadist orientation that ultimately says all of Palestine must be in Muslim hands and that you can win in stages and this diplomatic move was only one stage in a larger process and that he was never really committed to peace. What is your understanding of Yasser Arafat's motives in general, in terms of the big picture, in terms of really being able to say, we want, Palestinians want to live side by side with the state of Israel, we'll make a compromise on Jerusalem, we'll make some kind of, we'll accept a token right of return, but that basically the new Palestinian state will house all of Palestinian refugees and we will live if not in peace like Canada and the United States, we will live without conflict. To what extent do you believe that really was Arafat's motivation? I, I think that uh, he uh, changed his mind. He understood that uh, the only way to achieve his uh, national uh, goal was to do it side by side with Israel. He did not like us. We did not like him. Uh, but it was uh, it was uh, politically the the only solution uh, that that uh, he had, and uh, and you know that the same accusations 
somehow bear against us on the Palestinian side, that the whole Oslo process was just uh, an Israeli deception in order to continue with the settlements and uh, to, to never have peace and to have an interim solution forever and uh, to allow the world to pay for the Palestinian budget rather than Israel as the occupier, and so on and so forth. So the, the feelings of conspiracy uh, are not uh, only Jewish or Israeli, uh, but also Palestinians. And mm-hmm. uh, as in many other areas, uh, you have a mirror image of our suspicions and their suspicions. The, the point was, that you don't have many chances like we had in 93. There was an Israeli brave prime minister who took a decision and changed his mind and was ready to talk with the Palestinians and to, to the PLO and to, to make peace and to pay the price. There was a Palestinian uh, leader who was charismatic, accepted by the Palestinians, even those who opposed him. And they decided after... Uh, the, the Gulf, uh, the first Gulf War, to uh, make a peace with Israel. And there was a, a, an American president, a young man, who wanted to have a big achievement in foreign affairs. And here we came and suggesting, suggested it to him without him doing anything about it. And uh, he was very happy and he was very proud financially and whatever. Mm-hmm. He was committed. Mm-hmm. You don't have such a meeting of of, uh, of souls uh, very often. Yes. But when you have it, sometimes you dismiss it and you believe that it will be there forever. Mm-hmm. And it is never so. Yossi, what about now? Is any of your idealism tempered in any way? What do you believe is possible now? in creating a two-state solution with the leadership that's in the Palestinian world today, would Mahmoud Abbas and Fatah on the West Bank, would Hamas in Gaza, would they be willing to enter into the kind of peace process that you were able to generate in 1993? When you now talk to Danielle, do you still say to her there can be peace, or are you less optimistic than you once were? You know, my main goal has been to keep Israel as a Jewish democratic state. For a while, I, I supported the idea of a Palestinian Jordanian uh, confederation. Yes. I was the one uh, who uh, was there in London with Paris in '87 in the London Agreement, uh, in which uh, we, we actually suggested a very serious Jordanian option. So for me, what would happen on the other side was secondary to the main issue, which is the partition of the land in order to to assure that there is a Jewish permanent uh, majority. Now, I don't believe that uh, Netanyahu is ready to have a Palestinian majority uh, in the near future. It is a matter of of very few years. And uh, then I believe that he will have to choose between a unilateral state like Sharon living in Gaza, as the Likud leader, as prime minister, and uh, an agreement with uh, the Palestinians, whom he doesn't trust. And it will be up to him or uh, any prime minister who will be there uh, to decide. I'm not pessimistic because of the need, and the need of a Zionist prime minister would be to assure that he is not leaving his post when a minority of Jews are dominating a majority of Palestinians. And uh, I, I am preaching, of course, for an agreement, but I believe that at least a kind of an interim agreement, like a Palestinian state with provisional borders, according to the roadmap for peace, which was accepted by both sides and suggested by the quartet of the United States, the UN, uh, uh, Russia, and the, and the European Union, that something like that, like that may be realistic, take, taking into account the fact that the Israeli Prime Minister of today is not ready to pay the price uh, which is needed uh, to, for having peace, and the Palestinian uh, president cannot deliver Gaza as part of the agreement. Are you suggesting that if Gaza were not an issue, Mahmoud Abbas and Fatah would make peace with Israel, and that it's Israel's fault 
that there is no peace? No, no. Uh, what I'm saying is that they cannot deliver, but, but they can sign a peace treaty with us. I mean, had it been up to me, I would have signed a peace treaty with Mahmoud Abbas, which will be implemented only in the West Bank because he cannot deliver gas. So yes. for the time being, it would be on, only there. Yes. Bibi Netanyahu is not ready to do something like that because he knows that a, a, peace, a peace agreement includes the division of the East Jerusalem, and uh, some symbolic solution for the refugees, and he's not there for that. So I believe that what he can do is to agree upon the provisional borders for the Palestinian state. And uh, I, I don't. I think that it was a mistake of, of uh, Secretary Kerry not to uh, put all his efforts in the in the interim solution, knowing that Netanyahu will not be ready to, to uh, even to put on paper a solution like the Geneva Agreement or the Clinton Parameters of 2000. I understand that you're telling me you don't think Netanyahu is willing to pay the price. Is Abbas, exactly. is Abbas willing to pay the price? I think so. I'm, I'm not sure about it, but uh, let us say so. The parameters that Abbas is, uh, is speaking about publicly are much closer to the international parameters than what Netanyahu is saying. I'll never agree that one settler will be moved. I'll never go back to the 67 borders. I'll never divide Jerusalem, and I will not allow one uh, refugee to enter Israel. This is something which is against all the, the, uh, the international parameters. You may, say, you may say that he is right. You may say that he is wrong. But this is not uh, something that the world has agreed to while Abu Mazen is speaking in the universal language of an agreement. Yossi, it has been a real, it's been both an honor and a kick for me to be able to talk to you. And you have been so patient and you've given me so much time. You know, I told you before we went on air, I am a huge fan of the work you do and of everything you stand for, Birthright Israel. You have an incredible, distinguished career in Israeli politics. I really hope one day, either when you're in New York or when I'm in Israel, you will sit with me face to face and we'll talk more about both your view of where Israel is today and we'll go over some of the same things we did here about the incredible work you've done for Israel. Kol tu Thank you very much. Uh, and as you, Shana Tova. Shana Tova to you, and you be well. We'll talk again. Thank you, Yossi. The thoughts of Yossi Balin, the man who really forged the Oslo peace process that then led to the Oslo Accords and a historic handshake on the lawn of the White House in September of 1993. I hope you've enjoyed meeting Yossi on JBS. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.